All right, welcome back to the podcast. Today I'm joined by longtime friend Morgan McCarthy. Morgan, how are you doing today? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. Yeah, so we've known each other ever since the uh, elementary school days. You were friends with my brother and his grade yes. and kind of followed along each other's story here and um, excited that you reached out wanting to share your story with, um, you know, kind of how disabilities impact mental health and um, you got a lot of good stuff to share. So I'm excited that you uh, reached out and wanted to share your story with people. Yeah, me too. Nice. So do you want to, uh, you know, take it from the beginning, your journey? And um, I know I'm probably going to uh, butcher some of these medical terms. So I'd rather <laughs> have you. Okay. Go it. Yeah, I'll do that first. So I live with spastic diplegia cerebral palsy. That is a neurological disorder where I have periventricular leukomalacia. It is basically what some people would consider stroke-like symptoms. I lost oxygen in the womb when I was born and they don't know how it happened, when it happened, any of that. I wasn't a twin, I wasn't a preemie, but it's basically oxygen loss. So my messaging system does not work like yours. I have to basically talk to myself every day to do simple things like walking, talking, directions, like where my body is in space, stuff like that. Wow. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, it's, uh, you know, something we all probably take for granted, just the ability to breathe and, you know, have that oxygen. Yeah. So how has, how has it impacted you and, you know, growing up? Growing up, I mean, K through five was pretty chill and I just kind of went along with it. I definitely think middle school is hard for everybody. And then High school, I just feel like high school flew by because everybody was so busy. I know you played hockey and like with me, like I was cheerleading for like football season, basketball season. There's like all stars. Like I was constantly doing something like six days a week and then on top of homework and everything. So that was wild. Um, and then in college, I, because our school that I went to did not have a cheerleading team because we didn't have football. I did volleyball all my sophomore year and then went and did statistics with the school. So I worked with the athletics department, got all the perks being with the team and helped them keep track of all of their statistics and game plays and fun stuff like that. So that structure definitely keeps me on the straight and narrow, I think. I think it can be really challenging because my entire life, 27 now, and for the rest of my life, because I found out when I was two years old, I'm not gonna ever be able to not think about those things, like simple things like getting out in bed in the morning. So working out and doing sports and those types of things have always kept my head in the right place. There's definitely times where it's not, but I think that's definitely a big go-to. Even now as an adult with Corey, you were talking about forever athlete and I'm like, you, your mindset and like how you play and the things you do are like an everyday thing. So I really resonated with that and like his tips too. So I have some cool tips, but I definitely agree with his like, six bullet go down of like how to live your life yeah totally um and i i can absolutely relate with the athlete piece and you know still having that structure even if it's you know just an adult league two times a week or whatever it is um immensely helps me apologize my dog's yipping in the background no um, that's okay mom <laughs> is like bouncing around in here too um, so yeah, aside from, you know, athletics and, um, sports, what else have you found that's, that's helped your mental health? I definitely do a lot of yoga, a lot of meditation. I read a lot. I gave you a link to, um, a book that is kind of how I live my life off of the most recently, like figured out that that's how I explain to people. Cause I get asked all the time, like, 
why I'm so happy or how I stay so positive or whatever. And for me, Viktor Frankl in Man's Search for Meaning, he basically, I'm surmising, says you have a choice with your attitude amongst your circumstances. So my mom and my parents specifically are like, you can be in charge of your emotions. Like, yeah, this sucks for you. And sometimes it would get really hard and I had some dark places and I had like outside intervention for different things. And it was just like, they always told me, you have the power to decide if you're going to be happy today or not. So now (laughs) I use that as motivation to continue meditating, continue my yoga practice. I speak with a life coach regularly. I go to the gym every Friday. You guys can follow me on Instagram if you want. You'll see the workouts like once I do them, I post them. And it's just so I can see myself back to think that's important for somebody like me who's got a little bit of like comparison envy I guess I look at everybody else who's just like grinding and I know that when I'm in the gym my body doesn't look the same or like people have questions and so I'm constantly like recording little snippets just for me for later for myself but then it comes back to other people and they're like, whoa, how'd you do that? And I'm like, well, let me show you. Yeah, that's cool. And it's a nice lesson there to just compare your progress in the gym or anything just with a former version of yourself. So I feel like oh, yeah, it's definitely. a really healthy practice. Um, and then, um, you know, so you mentioned that your book reading, um, you don't do drugs or drink very often. Um, yeah. um, but, yeah. I do socially. Um, it kind of helps, to be honest. Um, it's like an old school trick. I don't advocate for it per se, but you know, once you're 21, my doctors were like, it does help give me the relaxation. So I enjoy it socially. Like, I'll have a glass of wine with dinner if it's like a holiday, but. I pretty much stay away from all that stuff because I don't need it. I'm happy how I am and it was never an issue. And if it, I mean, for the people that it is, I know that for me, it was other things that just in my brain chemistry, like changing, like if you were in pain as much as I am, like 24 seven, I have like a really high pain tolerance, like that changes your brain chemistry. So Mm. for me, it was kind of like, I used to like use rubber bands and things like that just to have like that kind of sensory overload. So like alcohol and drugs is never a thing. For me, it was more like how much pain can I put myself in to like have a response to something else? Hmm. Do you think, um, you know, that, that was caused on or that was part of your depression or anxiety? I think because it's not like you want to, like when I was like 14, 15, it's not like you want to escape your life or anything. For me, it was more like, just this sense of complete overwhelm that I'm, I tell people all the time, I'm not going to be able to turn this off. Like you can have a rest day in the gym. I cannot get rid of my CP and I don't think I would Hmm. if I had to do life over again. I don't think I would. It's given me so much perspective for like how grateful I am to get out of bed, put my feet on the floor, like walk my dog, nourish myself, like those things, even just because I don't drive a car. I'm the one in the passenger seat that gets to look out the window and be like, yo, did you see that cow (laughs) in that person's like yard? Like, I'll just be like, look at how beautiful life is. And I think if I didn't live in the body that I live in, 
I wouldn't know that, or at least it would have taken until now in your later 20s to find that. I noticed it when I was super young because I was like, oh my God, breathing's hard. Oh my God, like tying your shoes is hard. Imagine if you couldn't do that. Yeah, empathy. Like, mind blowing. Right. Yeah, it probably makes you way more empathetic towards people of all situations. Definitely. And uh, I like what you said. You wrote me, you know, a nice paragraph before coming on. And one of the things you talked about was like that you didn't like being called an inspiration. You liked the word admiration. Do you want to yeah. expand that's, on that? That's such a big thing for me recently. I don't know if you're into Brene Brown. Yeah. But okay. So her Atlas of the Heart just came out on HBO. And I think it's in the second or third episode. I might be wrong. There's like five and they're like an hour long. She talks about that, about the definition of admiration versus like being inspired in the awe and wonder factor of life. Like for me, it's such a thing in society to post on social media, like, oh, like so-and-so went to prom with so-and-so, like how cool of that person for asking that girl to go to prom. And it's like, everybody goes to prom. And so for me, in the experiences that I've had, like, yeah, I've gotten to do some really cool stuff. I work with the New York City Ballet. And, you know, I've been on a couple of large TV networks. And I'm in a medical textbook. So, like, it's stuff like this that I do that other people aren't just going to wake up and be like, okay, today's Thursday. I'm going to be on a podcast. Right. Like, I have the luxury of being able to do that. So, instead of saying like, oh, I inspire you for me. I want to be like, yeah, you can admire me. But then if you really want it, you can go out and get it yourself. Like I still tie my shoes every day, get up and go do what I got to do. Just like you probably would. Yeah. But does it take me like an extra 10 minutes? Oh, yeah, it definitely does. Because I have to tell myself. Hmm. You're tying your shoes right now and do the whole bunny ear, bunny ear loop around. Like, I have to tell myself that. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's important to be that admiration for someone else, right? So there's probably a younger girl out there just like you looking up to you. Uh, yeah. You that admiration piece for. But it, that definitely, like, when I watched that on HBO, I was like, oh, my God, light bulb. Because I was so sick of being like, like people telling me oh you're so inspiring and i get it it's probably the first word that's on the tip of people's tongues but it's like i know in our community of people that are disabled we're all kind of like hey yeah we do that we just do it a different way so it's a better word and in the context of when people are doing things like this, like a podcast or interviews or any articles that people write, it changes the narrative from like a poo pooey or like overexposed narrative to where it's like using us so you feel better about yourself. Hmm. And like, I know that comes off as harsh, but it's like, that's like the reality for some people. It's like, I'm not a spectacle for you to all of a sudden feel better about yourself like i'm doing exactly what you do but maybe in a different order or a different set of steps so that it's functional for my lifestyle right it's, it's like way more equitable that way yeah yeah that's um yeah it's got to be it's got to be uh i don't know do you, do you find yourself like in groups with other people or do you, are you connected with, um, you know, other people that have the similar disability? Yeah. And it's, you know, be, that's a big thing for me too is CP is so vast. There's people that live with quadriplegia who have all four of their limbs affected. There's people like me who suffered like stroke like symptoms and maybe both their legs or one side of their body doesn't work great. And 
for me recently in the last couple of weeks, I did another podcast about dating. And that was one of the questions they asked me. They were like, so you hang out with like your same group of people, right? And I'm like, well, yeah, but I also had to have like a serious conversation come to Jesus moment with myself Mm -hmm. because I never actually thought about the aspect of like wanting to be in a relationship with someone who also had CP. Like in my mind, I was like, for lack of better terms, this is going to be the blind leading the blind. Like it gets dangerous. Like, but then I thought about it and was like, but why does it matter? So those are like heavy conversations, but they do happen between groups of us where it's like, this is the narrative we want to give, or like, this is what I like to say about how I personally feel. It's always like in, almost like from yourself, like your personal experience. So I can only speak for somebody who has spastic diplegia and who has a limb difference, like my fingers and toes genetically, I have a thing called brachydactyly. And I always forget to say it, so I'm bringing it up now. <laughs> um, but it, it that part two for me, it brought up a ton of feelings towards vanity and like what people like to see and like jealousy and like kind of the evil jealousy of like, do you really want this for yourself or are you afraid of how it looks? Cause for me one day, God willing, I'll hopefully be engaged and have a family and be able to go mono skiing with my kids. Cause that's, I want to teach my kids how to ski, but again, I just have to do it sitting because it's safer for me to do it on a big willy and sit and have the binder like clip into the chair without rigors and go down the mountain. But like, that's how I'm going to teach my kid how to ski. Like, you know what I mean? So I think to myself, but that's my journey. There's bits and pieces that people hopefully can pull from this conversation that apply to their life. Yeah, totally. That was that was awesome. I mean, I think that's a that's a great visual to hold of yourself in that mono ski teaching yeah. your kids. It's something I strive for, and I mean, that's why over the past little bit, I definitely know that COVID like put a big hole in the world for about three years. But even a little bit before that, a lot of the services that are given to people in my situation. And when you're in your early 20s, like if you want to be an alumni, you can go to things and be like 22 and still ball out and like ski for yourself, like with the instructors that know how to get you down the mountain. If you like flip over, like we're clipped in everywhere when we're in those. So if you fall, you you can't pick yourself back up necessarily unless you have some serious upper body strength, which I do. But still, the assistance is sometimes necessary. And, you know, for my adult life, they don't have that. Like, it comes out of my pocket or getting a grant or buying my own equipment. But it, that is something that's at the top of my list, though, is to make sure that I can still teach my kids how to ski. It's just going to look a whole lot different than mom and dad going down the mountain when you're, like, two-year-old doing yeah. french fries. It's not going to look like that hmm. from my point of view. Were you involved in the uh, Double H adaptive? Yes. Program? Yeah, nice. Yep. Yeah, my mom pretty did my that. Whole, pretty much my whole childhood. I started there when I was nine and went all the way up to when I was 21. And then I just got old. I kind of was like, ow, this hurts. I'm like throwing myself at the ground at some point. But um, Yeah, it's I an amazing it. program. Yeah. I volunteered for one year or one season. I feel like yeah. I remember that. Or maybe I saw your brother up there one day and your mom. I do remember you guys being up there. My mom did it like maybe four years in a row. But there was one year where my brother, my sister, and me all did it with her in one year, um, which was awesome. But, yeah, yeah, what what an experience to see, uh, you know, all different types of kids from all different types of situations with, you know, feeling that wind on their face going downhill. Like a lot of them were blind. Um, Yeah, just 
Yeah, and so program. What's that? I'm glad I did it because I don't think I would have known that there were resources out there to go do that. Like it's a half, like it's a half hour, forty five minutes away from where, like where we're from, and like to know that I have my own like private mountain when I was a teenager. It wasn't like, oh, what are you doing this weekend? Oh, I'm going skiing. Oh, you're going skiing? I'm going skiing too, but I'm going to this like special place that's private because it meets my needs. Yeah. Like I can still do it, but it meets what I what I need to have in order to be functional in society. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Uh, I, yeah. feel, I feel like we should clip that part and give it to Double H for a, right? for a promo. I always feel like I'm like, I still did what everyone else did. I just went somewhere else. Yeah, um, that's wicked okay, cool. So is there any any other things you would say to you know a younger version of yourself or somebody who's got the same, same disease or same uh, disability, different disabilities? Definitely. I think, you know, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to need help. It's okay to use intervention where needed, whether it's meditation, yoga, a doctor, a therapist, medication. Did I say that already? (laughs) I don't know. There are things out there for people and you don't have to suffer. Like that was, I think my biggest issue, like I said before, I felt like by the time I was in ninth grade, I was letting myself suffer with the fact that I knew I wasn't getting any better. So the daunting task of like going to school, going to therapy, going back to school to then cheer for three hours at a basketball game to then come home and do homework and like things like that is so repetitive and ongoing and I never got a day off. So when I think back to my younger self, I just would have said, don't let yourself suffer for so long. Like ask for that to be met sooner. And I know it's hard to admit to people sometimes, but I have a great family. I'm very, very close friends. You know, it's hard for me and why I love social media so much. All of my friends are all over the country. Like I have friends from the limb loss community and friends with CP. They're like literally everywhere from Alaska to Canada to, you know, California and all over in between. So it's not like they're my next door neighbor. I can't just get up and go get coffee with them. Right. So for me, posting as much as I do, which is a lot. Um, and I know that's something I'm working on. But like having those interpersonal relationships too, like that's key. As long as you can, for me, stick with the schedule I've had for the last, you know, 25 plus years of my life, that schedule does work. Yeah. For me. Are these um are these friends that you've met like online through the communities or have you met up with them in person? As I've well? met up with them in person. Um, a couple of years ago, I got the opportunity. I don't know if you watch the Bachelor franchise. A wow. couple years ago in 2019, I got to go to Utah with Sarah Heron. She was on Chris, um, not Chris Holes. Sean Lowe. She was on Sean Lowe's season when, so the guy from, I think he's from Texas, blonde guy, season 13. Look it up. Okay. Um, My sister probably knows. <laughs> yeah. And she has a limb difference and she doesn't have her left arm. So we got to go and like go rock climbing and do yoga in the middle of the NAC in Park City, which again, um, Corey, Park City, I love it. He's talking yeah. about it. Um, so I got to go there, met a ton of women and girls and moms and everything under the sun. And that was such a good experience for me because I was able to meet those girls that you were like, 
are there little girls out there that you're gonna like blow their minds right now yeah and i actually like keep in touch with a couple of those Mm -hmm. girls who are now in like middle school and going to high school and the tough stuff that happens when you look different than other people and then with anything cp related i did a lot of work in new york city before the pandemic so again like new york city ballet i've been in a medical textbook i've modeled i've done tons of charity work um name dropping met peter thomas roth the skincare guy um and it's because he got some cole hahn merch and like donated a bunch of money like bought a bunch of bags and i was it said um roth comma peter thomas and in my head i was in 11th grade in my head i was like oh like do to do like typing in this excel spreadsheet that he went in and like obviously picked it up from the auction block i was like oh yeah check i thought about it and i was like that's the guy that owns the skincare empire <laughs> like my brain was just like no freaking way so i've had tons of opportunities like that and those moments where you're like meeting ryan seacrest or whatever because i did that too um (laughs) it's like i go and i get to meet these people but these awesome people are also donating their time energy and services to making sure kids like me have access to education modifications hoyer lifts in their homes like that's what all that money goes towards so i do a lot of advocacy work to work on those projects so that people have like research opportunities because we're kids with cp but newsflash we're adults with cp too and that's one of the things in society too is that i think people forget that the kids with cp are going to grow up and they're going to be adults and they still need services that are going to be able to support them through their life too. So I do a lot of that work, a lot of nonprofit fun stuff, but hopefully telling my story gauges people to go and help and donate, even if it's your time, if you can't financially donate, like making a new friend means the world to people like me. Because I often am alone, but I feel like it's just because I have a level of maturity that takes a long time to harness unless you've been through something catastrophic that like makes you feel like you're like, oh, I grew up quick. Um, So that's kind of what it is. I love doing it. it makes life so much fun and I'm so grateful for those opportunities too. And it's a fun party trick. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you 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 nailed it there with uh, growing up quick when you go through stuff like that, and you know, you're light years ahead of age twenty seven at this point. You know. Yeah, but there's parts of me that are still pretty young. I might not move like everybody else, but my spirit's definitely there. I've got a fighting spirit, that's for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. That's uh, clear to see. Um, I uh, yeah, I was gonna ask you too, just because I've had Wes Woodson on Corey Camp and now Morgan McCarthy three in a row of mm-hmm. this uh, this double letter alliteration. Um, but you seem to be a, a big fan of the podcast, and I appreciate you listening to some of the episodes. What um, is there any? Any highlights so far or special things that other guests have said or stuff that you've enjoyed? For me, I, I hope he hears this if he um, if he watches his episode back. Derek Melanson is actually one of my older sisters, like best friends from childhood. Wow. And so when I listened to that episode, I just got like a ton of like, warm and fuzzies because like when Derek was telling his story that's the Derek I knew when I was like four five six years old like in the basement of our house being like will you put me on your shoulders so I can like get this 
like ballooned off the ceiling like wow and so when he told his story i was like oh my god like did i really actually know that about him or was i too little to like process hmm. everything he's been through so that was like where i was like i gotta email garrison and i gotta go do this yeah that's awesome it's cool to see two worlds colliding like that or yeah or to had no no idea his episode was awesome I've, I've gotten some other good feedback yeah uh, but just goes to show you you never know what other people are going through and that's yeah. why i'm so so grateful for people like you and other people from our hometown and stuff to just come on here and share their story uh, yeah you never know who it's gonna help definitely Nice. Well, thank you so much. Do you have any any parting words or last things? Uh, get your Instagram name in here too. Yeah. You can follow me at Mobies19. That's my like nickname from childhood. It, it looks weird written out, but phonetically that's what it means. Um, my mom calls me Mobies. That's like where it came from. And um, I'm on TikTok under Morgan Bethany. I just started using it, but it's merely so that other people with similar situations can go find me. Some of them are like funny and other of them are just like the trends that everyone does, but it's there. And I mean, you have my contact info. So if you want to put it in the down bar, like people can email me if they feel called to and I'll put them in connection with the powers of the so if they want to donate and like go say hi to double h and stuff like that in the down bar yeah totally i'll i'll link double h's website and then i'll put your email if anybody wants to contact you directly yeah thanks for having me though this is like super cool and it's something i've always wanted to do and i finally was like oh yeah i probably should talk to him about that because i saw your mom at the store one day oh yeah like is he like around and she's like yeah and i'm like i yeah i need to go contact him that's awesome yeah i'm glad uh glad you connected with her as well yeah. i'll definitely pass along tell her you say hi yeah that's great all right Morgan. Have a great night yeah you too thanks so much bye bye